So I think the next set of speakers are feeling the pressure. <laughs> this is, will be the, the finale of this incredible couple of days here. So, um, and I think they uh, will rise to the occasion. Will Allen and Kate Dusterberg have been an inspiration to all of us in the organic community. Um, I had an opportunity with a bunch of folks um, a few months ago to spend time with them at Cedar Circle Farm in Thetford, Vermont, where they both um, manage the, the farm there um, and spend time in their home, which is a beautiful homestead um, in that area of Vermont. Um, Again, as I said with Jim, um, these folks are pioneers and have led the country uh, in advancing organic as a concept and as a reality. Uh, Will having been a part of the formation of the California Certified Organic Farmers uh, in, and then in 1990 having found the organic uh, cotton or sustainable cotton project a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping cotton growers transition to organic production and working with cotton companies to encourage them to purchase and use organic cotton in their manufacturing processes. Revolutionary at the time, today a reality in many, in many places. And then Kate uh, has been done extraordinary work having worked for rural Vermont uh, uh, moving uh, to the College of Agriculture at the University of Vermont, where for many years she ha um, ran the uh, UVM Center for Sustainable Agriculture and served as a pro program coordinator there and worked with Women's Agricultural Network. So this is, you know, what we call in Washington a power couple. <laughs> <laughs> because they are and have both independently and synergistically together created incredible change and vision and just over the couple of hills out here served as a model for all of us uh, and the future. So come on up here, guys. Thank you. Oh, I forgot to say one very important thing about Will. Uh, he serves on the board of the Organic Consumers Association and now Regenerative International, Regeneration International. Um, and as most of you know, OCA has been instrumental in engaging the public and consumers in organic uh, issues, policy, and practice. So. Hey. Um, well, I just want to say I'm really honored to speak to all of you and um, being here with all of the wonderful people that have spoken and all the people I've talked to that haven't spoken has just been fabulous and I really am honored to be here. I grew up on a small farm in Southern California when um, LA was the largest agricultural county in the country. And every place around us was farms. And we had a tiny farm, um, about six acres, and which was about the average at the time. And at the time, cotton farms were 17 acres. Um, I sold my first crop of wiener pigs when I was five, and I cried for two weeks. Because I was totally in love with the pigs, and played around with them, and rolled around with them. And, I knew they were going to get butchered because my dad butchered and, you know, smoked meat. So um, I went on and graduated from the University of California in 1963 and, and went to the University of Illinois. 1964, I began to study tropical forest farmers in Peru and received my Ph.D. in 1968. 
In the late 1960s, we found out that my two boys had Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. We had already started to farm when I was still teaching at the University of California, and we began to worry about the chemicals being used by us and our neighbors and what impact it could have on the boys. This led us to research how we could farm better. I was fired by the university in 1970 for anti-war and civil rights activities and was accused of burning the Bank of America. <laughs> now I'd probably get a award. <laughs> Fortunately, all 20 defendants in the bank burning trial were acquitted, but several of us received jail sentences for lesser offenses. I got sentenced to a year in jail for failure to disperse, inciting to riot, and mischievous mischief, whatever that means. <laughs> and after getting out of jail, I decided to uh, farm full-time organically instead of returning to work at the university and I could be closer to my kids that way. I farmed vegetables and melons in Oregon for two years and farmed the same crops in Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo counties from 1973 to 1975. In 1975 I moved to Yuba County to work with doctors who felt they could help my boys. We rented land in the foothills of the Sierras and raised dairy goats, milk cows, hogs, garlic, and melons. In 1979, we moved to Crow's Landing in the San Joaquin Valley. We were one of the first organic farmers to try our hands at farming in the valley, which is really the belly of the monster of California chemical agriculture. We were farming organically, but we did not become certified until 1982. In 1982, I joined the boards of CCOF and the Steering Committee for Sustainable Agriculture, now called the Ecological Farming Association. At that time, both of these organizations were in their infancy. CCOF did not even have a handbook to guide farmers on acceptable practices. But we got one really quick when we found out that Maine was going to write one, and we wanted to be first. So we wrote the first handbook in of certified organic farmers in the country, and we got Nature in Progress from France to help us out. In 1990, I was hired part-time to be the toxics director for the California Institute for Rural Studies. We focused on radiation transfer stations, emissions, with, and emissions with cotton toxics. During that period, I was appointed to the Montreal Protocol Committee for ozone-depleting substances. Many of the scientists I came in contact with on the protocol committees were actually more freaked out about climate change than about ozone. Within the California Institute for Rural Studies, we started the Sustainable Cotton Project, and in 1993, we spun it off as a standalone NGO. At the Cotton Project, we created an organic agricultural extension project, the biggest one in the country that had an IPM program that helped growers convert to organic, and we did outreach to 62 clothing companies around the world. We had the largest biological IPM program, and we convinced several clothing companies and farmers to convert to organic, including Patagonia and Esprit and Levi's and the Gap and so forth. In 1998, we were able to hire my current wife, Kate Dusterberg, who will speak next, uh, to help us manage the project, because we were really farmers and didn't really know how to manage much except how to grow stuff. In 2000, now my wife, Kate Dusterberg, and myself, and two other partners took over the management of Cedar Circle Farm in Vermont. We managed the farm and SCP until 2003 when we resigned from the Cotton Project to manage Cedar Circle full time. Our goal at Cedar Circle was to create a local production for local use farm that had a political and social mission and Kate will present the array of activities that the farm is engaged in after my presentation. One of our first political acts was the completion of a book that we were working on, The War on Bugs, which is for sale out here, and which I'd started to write in 1996. Thanks to Kate's editing and strategizing, we finally got the book pub published in 2008 by Chelsea Green. 
After the book was done, largely because of the impact of the climate scientists had met with on the Montreal Protocol, I began to focus my efforts on the re relation between climate change and agriculture and discovered that agriculture was responsible for about 50% of greenhouse gases, and yet no one talks about it. We begin writing and speaking about that elephant in the climate change room that no one talks about. While this effort still occupies a large part of our energies, I'm not gonna talk about this tonight. Instead, I wanna to pivot to a local Vermont problem that we both felt needed to be dealt with. Throughout our time with the Cotton Project and Cedar Circle Farm, we had been anti-GMO activists. While on the board of rural Vermont, I helped pass a GMO farmer protection bill, which unfortunately, Governor Douglas vetoed. In 2011, we were able to create a local coalition with national and local support to draft, promote, and hopefully pass a GMO labeling bill. After more than three years of effort, we were successful and Vermont passed the first standalone GMO labeling bill in the U.S. and Governor Shumlin signed it. Of course, we were immediately sued by the Grocery Manufacturers Association and the Snack Food Association. Um, the following PowerPoint presentation summarizes the results of our most recent work on GMOs and Vermont dairy that emerged out of the labeling struggle. So let me figure out how to use this. Let's see. Um, you know, a lot of times we think that um, Vermont um, is this bucolic state where all the cows are on endless pasture and, um, and Ben and Jerry's ice cream is immaculate and safe, and now that they've dropped GMOs in their additives, it's even better. And that Cabot cheese, while delicious, is safe. And we found out that um, that's probably not true. In Vermont, dairy is the dominant agricultural deity. And so challenging dairy is really difficult because dairy is responsible for 75% of Vermont's agricultural products and supply, supplies 63% of all of the dairy in New England. And it's so powerful in Vermont that the um, Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets and the Agency of Natural Resources have refused to enforce the Clean Water Act for 43 years since Nixon signed it. They've never enforced it. And it's not just Vermont, it's all over the country. We haven't enforced the Clean Water Act with respect to non-point source pollution, and that's farming and forestry. Both agencies have also ignored the excessive and increasing use of herbicides on corn for dairy cows known to cause cancer, birth defects, and hormone disruption. During testimony to pass the GMO labeling bill, the uh, dairy industry lobbyists testified that pesticide and fertilizer use had dropped and the most toxic herbicides had been greatly reduced. We thought their testimony was, we thought they were liars. <laughs> I mean, they were wrong, but we knew they were lying because we'd read all the reports from Benbrook and so forth that showed that pesticide use was up dramatically and that yield was flat and that, er, and that fertilizers had gone up. Fortunately, in Vermont, one of the few states in the United States has three laws and they passed these laws and that, those laws greatly enabled us to analyze the pesticides, fertilizers, and the overall use of agricultural chemicals and GMOs. In 98, Vermont passed a law requiring pesticide applicators, both farmers and commercial applicators, to file pesticide use reports with the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. In 2001, Vermont passed a law requiring seed sellers to report the sales of genetically modified seeds. In 2002, Vermont passed a law requiring the agency to alter how they reported the use of fertilizers so that they were more transparent. Those three laws required that Vermont a the a Vermont Agency of Agriculture collect the data, but there's no requirement that the, the agency analyze it and act on it. So they don't. Because if they did, they'd have to act. 
Because of these laws, however, we were able to track pesticide use on corn since 99 and track nitrogen fertilizer and GMO use since 2002. Corn is the largest crop in Vermont and almost all of it is used for dairy. In 2003, only 8% of Vermont corn was GMO. By 2013, 96% was GMO. Because of Vermont state data, we were able to an act, analyze actual herbicide use um, instead of using USDA statistics, which are really surveys. Um, herbicide use increased by 39% as GMO corn became dominant. Benbrook has done studies nationally and he's only found that there's a 20% increase, but he's using USDA data, which we have found to be about half as accurate as the state data. So uh, the Vermont data indicates that there's a significant disconnect between state actual use data and the USDA survey data. And we found the same thing when we were doing the cotton project. We studied um, for 10 years, we looked at uh, pesticide use and we compared the state data in California with the federal data and the federal data accounted for 53% of the actual use. And in one year, it was as low as 38%. So, I mean, it's convenient for the USDA to say that because then they don't have to really go after those companies that are selling those pesticides. So, um, the other thing we found out is that pesticide use on corn became much more toxic during this period when we had been led to believe that it had become less toxic and that glyphosate, which everybody thought was a non-toxic pesticide, um, and that because glyphosate use had been higher, but we found out that um, five herbicides accounted for 99.4% of all the pesticide used on corn and Roundup only accounted for 7% during that period. And during the whole period from 2002 to 2012, Roundup only accounted for 4%. So the pesticides didn't get um, worse. I mean, better, they got worse. And the weed killers in order of quantity used were metolachlor, atrazine, simazine, glyphosate, and pendimethalin. Metolachlor is listed as a possible human carcinogen and has been shown to cause endocrine disruption and birth defects in animals. The US, EU has advised member states that metolachlor and its metabolites should be monitored because of groundwater contamination. This is the third most damaging pesticide contaminant in US waters. And its re-registration is up for you, uh, re review in the U EU. Atrazine has been classified by the EU as a possible human carcinogen endocrine disruption and causes birth defect. It is the second most damaging pesticide contaminant in US rivers, lakes, ponds, and streams. Because of these health and environmental concerns, the European Commission has refused to re-register atrazine in the EU. It's effectively banned in the EU. Simazine, a close relative of atrazine, has been classified by the EU also as a possible human carcinogen. Endocrine disruption also causes birth defects. It's also a persistent groundwater contaminant. It's also lost its registration in the EU. Glyphosate and glyphosate-based herbicides are probable carcinogens according to the International Agency for Research on Cancer, as we found out earlier in the presentation. There are also endocrine disruptors, cause birth defects, and potentiate antibiotic resistance. Glyphosate is the most damaging pesticide contaminant in U.S. rivers, lakes, ponds, and streams. Several states in the EU have already begun to ban the use of glyphosate formulations. Pendimethalin, the fifth pesticide, is classified as a possible human carcinogen and a suspected endocrine disruptor. This herbicide is also a major polluter of groundwater and drinking water. So the top five herbicides in bucolic Vermont, 
cause cancer, birth defects, endocrine disruption, and are the most polluting pesticides of public waters. In addition to these five toxic herbicides, each bag of GMO corn seed has a cocktail of pesticides that are not included in the Vermont or USDA inventories of toxic pesticides. These are the seed treatment pesticides. And this lack of state or USDA data is because the poisons were applied on Molokai or some other remote spot where Monsanto and the other corporations can grow three crops a year for seed and treat the seed with neonics and fungicides before being shipped to the US. Cottonseed is another highly used crop in Vermont dairy and farmers use from five to eight pounds a day. And that means 36,000 Vermont cows get at least 5.5 pounds of cottonseed per day and about 36,135 tons of cottonseed were fed out to Vermont dairy cows. More than 90% was GMO. Soy and soy meal is another highly used feed crop for Vermont dairy. We've not finished our analysis of soy yet because we can't get the records, they won't give them to us. But um, it's 90% GMO and it's, um, it's a hexane derived uh, meal just like cottonseed is. Um, and nitrogen fertilizer use also increased dramatically during this time. Use increased 17% per year, which was about 2.4 million pounds per year increase over the time when GMOs were not being used. So you have to ask yourself, how did this happen? Well, Vermont's dairy problems aren't unique. The number of U.S. dairies has declined from 648,000 dairies in 1970 to 46,960 in 2013. Latest year we have data for. The average number of cows increased from 20 to 200 on U.S. dairy farms. Vermont dairies declined from 6,000 in 1970 to 970 in 2013. Because Vermont regulators refused to enforce the Clean Water Act, farmers were allowed to discharge manure, pesticides, and synthetic fertilizer into rivers, lakes, and streams for ever since the um, Clean Water Act was passed by Nixon. State and federal regulators refused to limit the use of the most toxic water polluting herbicides and seed treatment poisons, even though they were banned in the EU. And so you'd think, well, Vermont would probably get rid of those, but wrong. So much of this changeover occurred because of saturation advertising, as I pointed out in the book that we wrote, The War on Bugs. A lot of the reason farmers do what they do is because they are inundated with ads about what they should do to be profitable. Many of the editorials in the Farm Journal in the early 2000s were written by Monsanto's technical specialist, Andrew Burchette. And so like, they're getting all their information really from the chemical companies. Clearly, Vermont's dairy industry, like the US dairy industry in general, is in trouble. Legal petitions to the US EPA are forcing the state of Vermont to finally enforce the Clean Water Act. And the Vermont dairies we found have discharged from 40 to 79% of the pollutants found in Vermont's waterways. Dairy farmers, including those that provide milk to Ben and Jerry's and Cabot Creamery, have already begun to line up and oppose these new effluent guidelines. We think that's a mistake. We've met with Ben and Jerry's staff and the Secretary of Agriculture and offered to help dairy farmers meet and exceed these guidelines and convert to organic, just like we did in cotton, and we were successful in cotton. We haven't been that successful yet in Vermont. But there are currently 200 organic dairy farms in Vermont, the highest percentage in the US. So we have a model right there. And if you can't grow organic dairy in Vermont, you probably can't do it any place. I mean, because we get incredible grass in Vermont because we've got lots of rain, lots of snow, and just the right weather to grow grass and raise cows. And there's a glut of GMO milk and a shortage of organic. And the price of milk right now is $14 a hundredweight. 
That's 100 pounds of milk. They feed out 132 pounds of feed to get that 100 pounds of milk. So they burn the cows out within three or four years. And our argument is like, since there's a glut of GMO milk and they're dumping it, a lot of the, of the non-fat milk they're dumping into their lagoons. Because there's no price for it. So now's the time to convert, and that's what we've been telling um, Ben and Jerry's. We, we're hopeful that we can work together to help Ben and Jerry's and Cabot begin to move towards organic production and help Vermont's dairies address their environmentally damaging practices. But the problem is, is that we now need to talk to the CEOs. We need to talk to the people at the top because at this point we've just talked to people at the bottom. We think that we can help them make a change and we think that we can get funding to set up programs and expand programs that already exist to help dairy farmers change. Um, we feel like we want to be positive. We want to, don't want to use all of the research that we've done as a hammer. We'd like to use it as a lever for change. And so I think this thing, anyway, um, so we feel like we can make a change and like we're using our farm as a platform to make that change. We feel like our farm is an example of how you can farm organically. Because um, when we bought our farm, it was a chemical farm and we switched it over to organic. Um, my wife is gonna speak next and she wants to show you pictures of our farm and give you an idea of how we use the positive things that are happening on our farm to try to use that as a platform by which we can be effective. And we've been effective in the State House so far, but um, we think we can be even more effective by helping dairy change and changing Vermont so that most of the farms or uh, cows are locked up right now. We think that's wrong and we think we can help change it. So my wife is next. Thanks, Will. Okay, thanks everybody for sticking with us. Thank you to um, uh, Beyond Pesticides folks, the great job that they've done on this conference and organizing everything. And thanks for inviting us to speak. I appreciate that. Um, also, um, thanks for having it in Maine because it's such a fun place to come to. We have, I do have some history of working in Maine a little bit. Um, or at least just some stories. When I first came to, uh, to Vermont about 20, 25 years ago, I started working at rural Vermont and one of my jobs was, or one of my assignments was to um, organize a nor uh, the Northeast uh, Sustainable Agriculture Working Group. And I worked with a bunch of Maine people and people from all the uh, other New England states to help pull that coalition together. Then when I went to the University of Vermont, I had some, um, some grants from SARE to do uh, multi-state uh, training for agencies and university folks and some of the MOFCA folks worked with me, Eric Seidman and Russell Libby at the time was at the Department of Ag in Maine. And then, um, and then we also, to set up the Center for Sustainable Ag at, the, at UVM, we used University of Maine Sustainable Ag Program as a model because they had a really good program at the time and one of the first things I did was come over and visit it, that program so that we could sort of get some ideas for how to set it up. So it has a lot of good memories for me. Um, I want to tell you about our farm and because it is a, it is a good positive model, it's a beautiful place, and we've been there for 15 years, so we kind of have figured out how to do it, how to um, farm organically, and um, also we, ha it ha we have an education program. We say that we are an organic farm, a community organic farm with a social mission. Um, and I want to sort of give you a picture of our farm 
kind of talk about what happens on the farm um, on a typical day and um, just give you some ideas of what we do. Uh, okay, how do I go this way? Um, our mission, we're an organic farm with a social mission. We engage the community to develop and share practices that promote regenerative agriculture, good health, and a resource-rich environment. Um, our motto is Feed, Inspire, Change, and we do that. Um, I guess I'm going to talk about how we do that. Um, I've thought a lot about this. About it's good, it's, it's easy to think about how you can feed the community uh, with good local and organic food. But inspiring change is, uh, it's a little bit more difficult to, to really nail that down and think of how exactly you do that. And as I was putting this talk together, I really realized that we try to inspire people, but also there's so many things that inspire us about doing this farm, which I'll talk about as well. Um, so this is a picture of our farm, and I want you to imagine that it's morning on our farm. Uh, we're on the Connecticut River. We have beautiful uh, uh, sandy loam soil. It's really great soil. Down in the, the whole farm is on the Connecticut River. Maybe the kids are there um, harvesting for our farm stand or our CSA. We have about 175 CSA members every year. Some of, the, some of the kids who work on the farm are, well, they're all local kids. Some are high school and some are college kids. But some of the young people who work there just want to be farmers. They, they're, you know, school's not for them. And um, they're really, an inspiring group of people that work for us and, and they're hard workers and they really believe in organic systems and organic farming and they believe in um, our social mission and in their very, it's, a, it's a, one of the most interesting parts of the job really. We have chickens, somebody will be gathering eggs to us for the eggs that we sell in the farm. Um, this is Al, he is a UMass graduate, but he wants to just work on a farm and he is, has a lot of responsibility there and he does all the processing and he sets every, packs all the boxes and sets everything up for um, putting, selling in our farm stand. Um, we do buy in, most of the, most of the products, you, all the vegetables you see here we grow, we buy in some things apples from some farms in uh, Brattleboro and some in uh, the Champlain Valley. We do buy some other uh, value-added products, um, but we try to have all organic and as much as we can coming from local sources. Um, we have a commercial kitchen, so another thing that happens in the mornings is that Allison's getting scones ready for um, sale in our coffee shop. Uh, people usually start to arrive around 8 a.m. and, um, you know, chit-chat with some of the folks in the coffee shop and see what yummy treats are there. Um, all this stuff is made right in our kitchen, the scones with uh, uh, fruit that grows on the farm. Um, we, in our kitchen, we um, try to capture a lot of the food that's grown on the farm. And um, part, of what we, part of what we try to do with the kitchen is to sort of extend the mission of the farm. And we, the way we do that is, one, by capturing more of the produce that's grown on the farm. If we have extra or if there were just other ways that we can uh, get people to buy and enjoy healthy, nutritious food that's grown right there, that's what we'll do. Secondly, we try to extend the season of local eating through preservation of the uh, foods that grow on the farm. Techniques like freezing, canning, drying, smoking. We do a lot of fermenting. Um, and three, to give customers a delicious and nutritious reason to visit the farm. And once they're here or at the farm, um, they'll still see where their food is grown, they'll talk with us about our work, and hopefully become more engaged in some of the 
um, and some of the um, the uh, the political uh, things that we're involved with. Customers start to arrive around 10 a.m. It's really fun to engage in conversation with customers because they they're usually people who love food, and especially the CSA members, and they like to talk about you know recipes or how do you cook this, or and they give us ideas and. Um, that's, that's inspiring to me, to see people really uh, just getting into uh, local food and really enjoying it and loving it. It's very, it's very gratifying. Um, this is a, or a school garden, so this may be also happening on a, a typical day of the summer where the kids are they're planting their little garden beds. We helped, um, we helped establish the gardens at the, at the elementary school, and every single grade is involved in either planting or they have a composting operation. Every year they do a, a, a taste test. Some of the, one grade will prepare the foods that they pick in the garden, and then some other grades will come and do the taste testing. Um, they, they use the food in the school garden in the cafeterias. Um, it's really, it's a really great program. Um, we grow a lot of beautiful cut flowers, and we do wedding flowers, and um, we also have a lot of bedding plants where people come and buy uh, flowers and vegetable bedding plants for their own gardens. So we have a series of gardening classes. We also do cooking classes. Um, we have a lot of kids that school groups that come to the farm to um, do tours or activities. We're going, to, um, we're going to do a summer camp on the farm this year for the first time. Um, that's going to be all focused on, you know, the kids interacting with the farm and trying to understand the relationship between ecology and where their food comes from. Um, Um, so, the far so that's kind of a picture of what we do on the farm. That's the that's the feed part. Um, but we what we really want to do is change the way that we in this country interact with food, and for people to realize that how food is grown makes a difference in our health and that of the community, and in fact the health of the whole planet. And that's why we're also about inspiring change. Um, so, the question is how does a farm inspire change? Partly we do that through our on-farm education programs, and partly we do that with our political involvement, and Will uh, talked about some of that. Um, in addition, we do some research on our farm, uh, and, and the areas of focus that we have been in place right now, we have been developing innovative crops uh, that help feed the community beyond just the regular uh, vegetables that are grown. And we're also really trying to focus on soil health and figuring out ways to increase our organic matter so that we can sequester more carbon. This is a field of sunflowers. Um, we've been growing sunflowers for the last five years or so. Just trying to figure out how to do it in Vermont. Several, not, it's not super common to see sunflowers in Vermont, but there are some. And we uh, turn it into uh, sunflower oil, so we want to have another uh, product to offer our customers. We've experimented with dry beans, which is another type of crop that's not super common in Vermont. And in order to have uh, an additional protein to sell to our local customers and uh, a type of protein that has a lower carbon footprint. And this is some cover crops that, we're, um, that we grow. I mean, we try to have cover, cover crops on all our fields every year, but we're, we're experimenting this year with um, trying to plant, do use a roller crimp, crimper and plant into cover crops and lower tillage, and um, hopefully we'll be successful at least at some point and um, be able to share that with other farmers. 
Um, and really what we're all about at the farm is <laughs> sometimes we say we do have a huge goal is to change the world, um, but we really want to continue our participation in the food movement um, and to do what a lot of you guys are trying to do is to change the way farming is done in this country so that we have a farming system that actually sequesters carbon um, in the soils and building on our capacity to actually reverse climate change. So that's a big focus of both our political outreach and what we're trying to do on the farm. Um, let's see. Uh, this is just some examples. Some of the things we've done, this is when we were participating in the March Against Monsanto rally in Montpelier. Um, but more sustained campaigns we've been involved with, which Will alluded to, is the labeling the GMO, the label GMOs bill. We were involved in that fight for three years, and we helped organize the coalition that was responsible for passing that bill, and that coalition uh, was made up of our farm, NOFA Vermont, VPIRG, Rural Vermont, and the Vermont Law School. Those were the four main players in that. And um, I heard a lot of interesting um, stories today about what, you know, people's attempts to do things at the community level. And we, there are a lot of similar stories. How do you, how do you build up um, support for those efforts? And how do you go about organizing, getting people to, um, you know, to support it at the legislature, and I, I just think we have a lot of similar uh, examples. Like one, one of the people from South Portland was saying, we none of our, you know, none of the people who live here think it's a bad idea to ban pesticides, and then that's how it was with the GMO labeling things. People thought there was hardly any opposition to labeling, and surprisingly, in the end even among the legislatures. legislators, there was hardly any opposition. We don't know what's gonna happen with the lawsuit and we, we don't know if we'll be two steps ahead and three steps back, but we're hopeful that it's going to um, go into, a, the law will go into effect on the scheduled date, which is July 1st. Um, and we also know that has had some impact because obviously when you have, uh, I mean, it's caused a federal, the, the feds to try to pass a uh, federal bill to preempt not only our state from labeling, but all states from labeling and preempt a lot of other states' uh, rights too. So it's, I think, with the little state, it's, we've done a lot. <laughs> I don't know, I think so. So um, also, we uh, were involved and we're one of the founding members of Regeneration International. This is a photo of the first meeting took place in Costa Rica in 2015, and there were people from 22 countries who were gathered there to start this organization that is, again, all focused on the soil and soil health and, uh, and its ability to sequester carbon and try to be an answer to reversing climate change. So the idea is not only to raise awareness among the people that agriculture is one of the major causes of climate change, but also that it could be one of the major solutions. Um, and the goal of Regeneration International is to build a global network of farmers, scientists, business, businesses, activists, educators, journalists, governments, and consumers who will promote and put into practice regenerative agriculture and land use practices that provide abundant, nutritious food, revive local economies, rebuild soil fertility and biodiversity, and restore climate stability by returning carbon to the soil through natural processes of, so, of photosynthesis. So the, re, RI was also very active and they brought a huge contingency of people to Paris to the climate summit and we were able to go there with them and kind of see this is, uh, this is a picture of from the climate summit. You see that that's Vandana Shiva and that other guy's Jose Bove. You guys know who he is. He's a he's a folk hero from France. He's, he he um, uh, has been involved with uh, 
fighting GMOs in France. He's a farmer and he's now a member of, parl a member of the EU parliament, I think. is a farmer member, but he's very outspoken and very cool. Um, so uh, while in Paris, we did observe that this was the first year that agriculture was even mentioned in the negotiations process. The French four per 1,000 initiative, which is their commitment to provide incentives for farmers to increase organic matter in their soils by four parts per 1,000, which um, Kristen was talking about the other night, paved the way for getting key issues related to carbon drawdown on the table. Many other countries pledged to institute similar programs, whether that's, this will actually happen, whether they'll find money to do to do so will still remains to be seen. And it was interesting for us to be in Paris because this was the first year we had ever been. And there were some people there who had been there for years and years and years, and they were very skeptical. And then there were others who had been there for, for a long time as well. This one fellow in this picture is um, Andre Lou from um, iFoam, and he'd been there for years, but he found it very hopeful, and he was excited that agriculture at least was finally on the table, finally being mentioned in the negotiations. So it's, um, it's interesting, and the, out of that, out of both of the, um, the Regeneration International work and the GMO labeling work, comes our next, this is our next project that we just started this organization called Regeneration Vermont, which Will had, has also mentioned. It's, and it's going to focus on trying to um, put pressure on the dairy industry in Vermont um, and try to get people, farmers, to farm more sustainably and get rid of a lot of the pesticides. And one of the reasons, I'm not sure if Will mentioned it, that we're really focusing on the two big companies, Ben and Jerry's and Cabot, is because uh, what percentage of the milk in Vermont will? Well, like about 63% of the milk in New England comes, you know, from the co-ops that sell to Ben and Jerry's and Cabot. Right. So 63. So they can have a, those two companies could have a huge impact if only they said yes, we want to make this commitment also to the environment, and we will like tell the, our farmers that that's the milk that, that, that we want them to go organic. So this is our, this is our new effort. Um, okay, so what I've been thinking about in the two days that I've been here, sometimes it, to, for me it gets overwhelming and sort of hard when you think that there's not been a lot of change since Rachel Carson's time. But on the other hand, there, there are so many things that are positive that I think are good to focus on. And there's so many things that are good that are happening. Like there are many, many, many farms. There are a lot of young people trying to get into farming these days. And there are an inc incredible number of organic, an increasing number of organic farms, farmers markets. More and more people are working on the issue of healthy soils and realizing how important healthy soil is to the future of our planet. There, we've seen from here, communities are establishing bans on pesticides, there are gardens on rooftops. There's so many legislative, legal, and regulatory efforts that are going on all over the country. And even the international negotiations on climate, there, we're seeing a change. And, um, we, but we need to really act quickly and to greatly expand that number of hopeful examples. We, we, I know that we need to work on all levels, and we've talked about that today, and we talked about it in some of the workshops, that we, you know, you can't get, you have to keep working on policy because you're never going to change the whole thing like Jonathan's slide showed all those Midwest farms that grow soybeans and corn year after year after year. And how do you change that huge behemoth? Of course you need, um, you need to change policies and you need to change the research system. Um, and um, Congresswoman Pinagree was pointing out, you, we know that less than 1% of or, organic, or of the research that's USDA funded is, is organic research. So those things have to change. But at the same time, um, 
I think maybe we are seeing a sea change. And, um, and Dr. Reiner was saying something in one of our um, meetings or one of the workshops today about that beyond pesticides is feeling this way too, that they're feeling like we're reaching a point where maybe we're, maybe we're getting to that tipping point where all these examples, all these individual efforts, the farms, the communities, are, you know, are going to at some point become the dominant way. And I think that with all of our efforts regarding farming, that we um, are also being helped and by the expanding um, and increasingly active conscious consumers movement to, who, to create the demand for good food and for regenerative farming. And I think that we just have to really keep fo focusing on the hope and the necessity of um, moving toward our goals quickly. <laughs> Thank you.